Ladies and gentlemen, this year's Special Recognition Award goes to Mr. David Tennant. Hello, my friends. It seems that the thin, dark duke has taken over my brain and refuses to leave. This man. <coughs> of all the numerous parasocial crutches I've filled the gaping hole in my heart with over the years, one has managed to loom ever so slightly larger than the rest. Not you, sweetie. I'm talking about a real person today. For as long as I've been remotely serious about storytelling and the performing arts, I've considered David Tennant to be my favorite and most influential actor, ever since I watched Doctor Who at just the right age for it to completely alter my brain chemistry. I feel like every aspiring thespian has at least one actor they'll watch in literally anything. David is mine. Even before I embarked on the months-long career deep dive I felt was required to make this video, I'd still seen around 10 movies and shows in which he played a prominent role, more than I had with any other actor. David admittedly didn't take up as much space in my brain during high school as he did during the earlier years of my nerd life, largely due to a certain other massively creatively fruitful hyperfixation with which you are no doubt familiar if you know my channel. However, this summer, a little thing happened called Good Omens 2, and all it took was one of the most talked about moments in recent fandom memory for it all to come rushing back. by the numerous self-effacing community posts, a slightly concerning amount of devastating ineffable husband's edits, and one too many YouTube shorts of me yelling about why David needs to be in a musical, it's not hard to see that for the past few months my brain has been on a constant loop of oh my gosh I freaking love David Tennant. And not without good reason. As it turns out, 2023 is a really good year to be a David Tennant fan. The man seems to be doing some major legacy cementing. Between Good Omens 2 being the iconic sub cultural moment it was, his highly anticipated return to Doctor Who this month, his Olivier Award nomination for Good, and his upcoming West End stint as Macbeth, a role I low-key feel like his entire career has been building to, we truly seem to be in the middle of a David Tennant renaissance. A tennessance, if you will. In the midst of screaming to my mother about the new Doctor Who trailers, I boldly proclaimed David to be the greatest UK actor of his generation. And judging by the responses to my YouTube and Tumblr polls, the overwhelming majority seemed to agree with me. David Tennant has had an absolutely remarkable career, one I believe has not only left an undeniable impact on myself, but on so many others who aspire to follow in his footsteps. And this impact, I believe, deserves a proper analysis. So I decided to do what I always do when I have uncontrollable brain rot about something. Write an unnecessarily long video essay about it. And that long last, here it is. 16 shows, 11 movies, countless interviews, 47 pages of script, at least three Proclaimers albums, and two months of being the most annoying person on the planet later. It may have cost me significant amounts of sleep and sanity, but hey, there's no shame in having an unhealthy obsession with something. David said so. In this video, I hope to examine David's cultural and personal impact through the numerous unforgettable roles he has played over the years, and what I believe makes him one of the most extraordinary actors of our time. So grab your sonic screwdriver and hop into your TARDIS or your Bentley, today we honor the weird and wonderful legacy of David Tennant. <laughs> actor of many contradictions. He's a sweet, down-to-earth family man whose resume is full of sluts and serial killers. He radiates joy and exuberance, but also weariness and tragedy. Depending on who you ask, he's either physically off-putting, just some guy, or the sexiest man on the gosh dang planet. I fall firmly on the side of the ladder. When praising David's acting talents, the first thing many drama critics point to is undoubtedly his range. The man can do it all. Heroic and villainous, intellectual and goofy, cheerful and somber, subtle and over the top, young at heart and an old soul. I mean, there's a reason I have a tendency to fan cast him in literally everything.
versatility is absolutely one of David's greatest strengths, it makes it rather difficult to put a finger on his defining characteristics as an actor. David seems to simply transcend labels, and many have tried and failed to assign him a type, with often hilarious results. And yet, there is still something about his performances that is just so distinctly, intangibly him. The majority of this video is dedicated to pinpointing those special, secret David ingredients. And what better place to start than with the role that made him an icon? I'm the Doctor. I'm a Time Lord. I'm from the planet Gallifrey in the constellation of Casterberus. I'm 903 years old and I'm the man who's going to save your lives and all six billion people on the planet below. You got a problem with that? My favorite word in the English language is brilliant. It also happens to be a word frequently used by the Tenth Doctor. Brilliant. 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 And I can't think of a better word with which to describe him. I'll never forget being 11 years old, sitting in front of the TV, and hearing David's first words as the Tenth Doctor, having no idea just how much that iconic grin would come to mean to me. I can't think of a more perfect character introductory episode in television history than The Christmas Invasion. You're instantly hooked by that supersonic wit, that uncanny ability to switch from lovable goofball to oncoming storm within seconds. You're watching history being made before your very eyes. Regardless of your opinion on him, you can't deny that the 10th Doctor was lightning in a bottle, the likes of which Doctor Who has been trying to recapture ever since. Much has been written by many a more knowledgeable Whovian than I about why David Tennant's Doctor is the all-time definitive version of the character, but as someone who's never had time to watch the classic episodes and is all too aware of how obnoxiously myopic 10 fangirls can get, I prefer to avoid making any claims of him being objectively the best and simply focus on what David brings to the character and why he's so special to me personally. I love every single one of the actors who've played the Doctor in the current run and will go to bat for the merit of their performances any day of the week, but man, Ten was just my hero. To introduce the uninitiated to a bit of Tumblr lingo, the Tenth Doctor was one of my earliest Blorbos, which simply means a character you love and think about a completely normal, not at all mentally ill amount. Something that's really annoyed me as David's matured as an actor and broadened his range of roles is this weirdly dismissive attitude a lot of drama critics seem to have towards his work in Doctor Who. When he did Hamlet, I saw far too many comments along the lines of, oh, now he's a real serious actor. He's so much more than just that silly sci-fi show. Like, I don't know if y'all know this, but playing the Doctor is really freaking difficult. Not only is he a hugely iconic character with a legacy spanning over half a century, you have to be good at everything to play him. You have to exude wit and charm, but also gravitas and immense tragedy, and have great physical stamina for all the inevitable chase scenes, and you'd better come across as really freaking intelligent because, oh right, you're playing an alien who's literal thousands of years old. People will watch David in things like Jessica Jones and Inside Man and be so shocked that the goofy, boisterous bloke from Doctor Who is showing off his dark side. Like, I'm sorry, did you forget the freaking Time Lord victorious? Are you telling me the end of Family of Blood wasn't pitch black? David's multifaceted and often contradictory acting persona made him an ideal fit for a character as complex as the Doctor, and his performance has rightfully gone down in history as one of the best and most memorable in all of television. It was one of the first performances I can remember looking at and thinking, holy crap. That's acting! The Tenth Doctor was everything a fantastic character should be and more. Simply trying to think of all the adjectives I could use to describe him makes my brain feel like Donna Noble absorbing all of the knowledge in the universe. He was brave and clever and goofy and full of energy and delightful oddness. He was a magnet to everyone who came into contact with him, yet could never manage to escape the loneliness of his existence. He was idealistic and compassionate, but also deeply jaded from centuries of watching everything around him die. At times, he acted like a god, at others like a broken, stunted child. The Tenth Doctor's relative youth, good looks, and resulting status as a bit of a chick magnet was something that was relatively new to Doctor Who at the time, and tends to be rather divisive among Whovians. I myself am definitely glad that the chick magnet thing mostly seems to have been left behind with the Matt Smith era, but I actually think David's boyishness adds greatly to the poignancy of this particular version of the Doctor. At the beginning of his run, he's allowing himself to be happy, to love and be loved, for the first time since the Time War, only for it all to get snatched away 
over and over again. He's heartbreakingly young, centuries of tragedy hidden behind that cheeky smile and unblemished face, and it's a testament to David's emotional depth and maturity as an actor that in spite of his appearance, he fully makes you believe it every time the story calls attention to the Doctor's sheer anxiousness. I'm so old now. I used to have so much mercy. It'll be fascinating to see how David's interpretation of the Doctor has evolved in the years since his original run, especially since he's now gone from one of the youngest actors to play the Doctor to one of the oldest, which I for one am maybe a little too pleased about. Crow's feet are pretty. In a way, Ten sort of is the youngest Doctor. Part of the reason his regeneration hits so hard is because this incarnation of the Doctor is only alive for six years so profoundly impactful both within the series and on popular culture in general, and yet in the context of a 2000 plus year lifespan, practically nothing. To me, Ten will always be the doctor who burned too bright, a brilliant firework faded to fizzle out only seconds after he erupts into being. Every moment Ten has on screen blazes with intensity, this is a doctor who feels everything, right down to the dual-hearted core of his very being. Joy, love, despair, rage, terror, every loss and every victory, whether bursting forth in passionate, frantic exclamations or veiled down to a somber, choked-back resignation. He made you feel as though you were experiencing this hurricane of emotions right alongside him, and what's more, he made you want to. It was absolutely intoxicating. And I was about as far from immune as you could possibly get. As much as a preteen girl could with a 900-year-old fictional alien, I fell in love with him. And what's more, I wanted to be him. I recently came to terms with my identity as a Shibe non-binary, and this is a really special video for me, as the 10th Doctor was arguably my first real gender envy. 11-year-old me really saw this lanky, slutty, mad genius with his pinstripe suit and ridiculous hair and manic hand gestures and bottomless joie de vivre and gargantuan amounts of trauma and thought, Oh, how I want what you have. I'd rather not get off track here, but I'll talk more about David and gender later in the video when I discuss a certain other character of his. Looking back, I realized just how much of my personality I attempted to steal from David Tennant throughout my adolescence, which, to be frank, was not the smartest social move, as society tends to be a lot kinder to quirky, unhinged, smart boys than it does girls with the same traits. My sophomore year of high school, I got to live out my chaotic, gender-bending dream when I was cast as Mercutio in Romeo and Juliet, a role I am still shocked David never played in a professional production. I think I unconsciously based so much of my Mercutio portrayal on David's acting style, his wide-ranging, slightly raspy vocal delivery, his rakish and unpredictable physicality, and his aptitude for masking deep anguish with humor and charm. More than anything, I craved the freedom and spontaneity David brought to his characters, his uncanny ability to access seemingly every single physical and emotional possibility available to him with all the enthusiasm of a kid in a candy store. My success with this has varied depending on my circumstances, but the one thing I know I did ironically gain from my attempts to emulate David was a jaw tension problem. Yeah, I realize this here, just how much David tends to emote with his jaw during particularly intense scenes, especially in Good Omens, which for musical theater is not exactly great for your vocal technique. So yeah, every time a teacher of mine tells me I need to relax my jaw, I tell them I think I just like David Tennant a little too much. I watched a video essay a while back that described the late, great Robin Williams as an actor who could make you believe in magic. And I believe David also possesses this rare quality. It's truly what sets his doctor apart in my opinion. Seeing the wonder of the cosmos reflected in those piercing brown eyes just made life seem like such an adventure. At the core of the Doctor, seeping into every one of his layers of flaws and tragedy and history, is a deep and abiding love of the universe and all innocent creatures who inhabit it. And I don't think it's a coincidence that it was David who was able to do the best job bringing out that quality. As David's father said in his NTA special recognition presentation, he loves people, and that's a great gift.
In all of David's best performances, I look at him and I see someone who just adores acting. What would he be if he weren't an actor? Unemployed. I feel like so many actors nowadays, talented though they may be, have lost that sense of pure, genuine love of their art form, growing so jaded by the harshness of the industry that they lose sight of what made them want to act in the first place, seeing the immense privilege of getting to inhabit an entirely new character as nothing more than a job that pays the bills. But I don't think David has ever let anyone steal his eagerness and joy or lost touch with his inner child. Even now at 52, I think that deep down, he's still the little boy that got in trouble at school for writing all of his essays about Doctor Who, and is just so incandescently happy and grateful for having gotten to become the character that inspired him to act in the first place. That's the main reason I think David's Doctor resonated with so many people, and why he continues to be the person you think of when you think Doctor Who. And you want to know the best part? He can do so much more than that. At some point during my Good Omens hyperfixation, I decided that having seen 10 David Tennant performances, a couple of which weren't even major roles, wasn't enough, and that I needed to go back and catch up on all the things I missed. I wanted to become an expert, a real student of David's work. Not every single thing he's ever been in, of course. I'm a music major, I'm not watching Ferdinand for David's five minutes of screen time or putting myself through all eight episodes of camping. But I've spent the past couple of months making sure I've watched at least all of his career highlights, as well as a few other things I just wanted to see him in, and boy have I had a fun time doing it. Watching a new David Tennant performance is like opening a present on Christmas morning. You never know what you're going to get, but you know it's going to be excellent, whether it's funny, emotionally moving, terrifying, or just plain delightful. He honestly just goes unnecessarily hard on every single character he plays. Like, the reason this video is so long is because I genuinely had a lot to say about just about everything he's ever been in. It's honestly rare for him to even just give like a normal good performance, like he simply must just knock it out of the park in the most unhinged way possible. And that's why we love him! It's been such a fun journey becoming more intimately acquainted with an actor I admired this much, and sitting down to watch him do what he does best every night was so wonderful to look forward to after a long day of working to improve my own craft. So now I'm simply going to go through all of David's performances that I've seen and talk about what he brings to each of these roles in terms of his skill and his own personality, as well as some common links I notice between these characters, starting with his first ever major television role in 1994's Taken Over the Asylum. I can genuinely say I've enjoyed just about everything I've watched with David, but there are quite a few cases where that enjoyment is primarily as a result of David's performance. He's the kind of actor capable of elevating anything he touches to its maximum potential, but while he's done very few outright bad projects, there are plenty of things he's been in that either have significant writing problems or just simply wouldn't interest me if he weren't in them. That is not the case with Taken Over the Asylum. This is a genuinely fantastic story from beginning to end. It's smartly written and funny and has so much heart without ever coming across as overly sentimental. It has so much empathy for people living with mental illness and absolutely devastating commentary about whether it's really worth it to pursue your dreams when all they seem to do is hurt you. And David's performance is just the cherry on top of a cast full of utterly endearing and colorful characters. Taken Over the Asylum follows Eddie McKenna, played marvelously by Ken Stott in a performance I would love to gush about if we didn't have more pressing matters to get to, a down-on-his-luck window salesman who sees an opportunity to pursue his dream of becoming a professional disc jockey when invited to start a radio station at St. Jude's Psychiatric Hospital. Through the radio station, he bonds with and enriches the lives of several of the hospital's patients, including series deuteragonist Campbell Bain, a 19-year-old manic depressive played by none other than an astonishingly fresh-faced, astonishingly Scottish 22 two-year-old David Tennant in all his toothy-grinned, long-limbed, floppy-haired glory. Campbell is brilliant, passionate, charismatic, sensitive, and more than a little unhinged. In short, you couldn't create a character more perfect for David if you tried. David as Campbell is simply effervescent, full of energy and youthful hunger that you simply can't help but be drawn to every time he's on screen. It's also more proof that David would have made a fantastic Mercutio in his younger years, especially since I also interpret Mercutio as bipolar. His energy Energy is such a galvanizing force within the show, and he seems to bring out the best in every actor he shares the screen with. 
Campbell is a character unafraid to let his freak flag fly, wearing the loony label with pride and a sardonic self-awareness. Eddie, I'm a mentally ill person. If I shout any louder, I'll be restrained and sedated. But David also beautifully captures the hurt and insecurity he experiences as a result of his disorder. At his core, Campbell is a dreamer, a stubborn, fierce optimist determined not to settle for less than exactly what he wants in life. But owing to his mania, his schemes are often too impractically grand for his own good, often ending in disappointment or worse, hurting himself or others. I have a feeling that a young David could relate a great deal to Campbell, with his single-minded pursuit of his acting dreams being seen as a huge risk by his family, and it's beautiful to watch Campbell gain the focus and support system needed to make his dreams a reality. While many actors' early performances tend to age poorly, Taken Over the Asylum holds up alongside some of David's best work. My favorite moment is probably the scene where Campbell fakes a manic episode, a classic and prototypical example of the David Tennant losing it scene. This is a term that my partner in crime Fiona and I came up with that refers to basically any scene where David just goes absolutely balls to the walls and delivers one of the most insane gut-wrenching performances you've seen in your entire life. Examples include, but are not limited to, Casanova's prison break, everything leading up to Ten's regeneration, Kilgrave's reunion with his parents, the bookshop fire scene from Good Omens, Harry's final breakdown from Inside Man and like three different Hamlet soliloquies. I can only imagine what David's co-stars must have thought about working with him on this series. You know they just had to be thinking, this kid's gonna be a star. David has expressed shock and amusement at the fact that the younger generation even managed to find Taken Over the Asylum, as it sadly faded into obscurity over the years. But it's a testament to the kind of passion David inspires in his fans that his performance has granted Asylum something of a second life, with it even becoming a bit of a cult classic in its own right in recent years. I absolutely absolutely love this show, and Campbell is easily one of my favorite characters David has ever played. And we're just getting started. Now, if only I could hear 52-year-old David say, We are loonies, and we are proud! Say it! We, we are loonies, and we are proud! Blackpool. Fast forward 10 years and our favorite Scotsman's star begins to rise in earnest with the quirky murder mystery miniseries Blackpool, which has the honor of being maybe one of the weirdest shows I've ever seen. Blackpool stars the excellent David Morrissey, who Whovians may recognize as Jackson Lake from the episode The Next Doctor, as Ripley Holden, a tenacious, egotistical arcade owner whose budding empire begins to collapse when he finds himself the prime suspect of a murder that took place on the arcade grounds. Enter David as his chief rival, Dia. Peter Carlyle, which as far as I know marks the beginning of the long and esteemed tradition of David playing brooding detectives and harbingers of death to seaside Scottish towns. Carlyle tasks himself with charming Ripley's discontented wife, Natalie, in order to nail Ripley for the murder, but quickly develops actual feelings for her, which threaten to compromise his judgment in regards to the case. He's, of course, the most entertaining character in the show, with David giving him a delightful mix of earnestness and dry cheek. He can honestly be quite the manipulative prick at times, and you frankly shouldn't be rooting for him as much as you do, but he's just so delightfully down bad, you end up forgiving him anyway. Man, those brown eyes should come with a warning label. Blackpool's tone is entertainingly pulpy and camp, with its score and aesthetics giving it an almost neo-western flavor. But what really makes it stand out is its central gimmick, which is that it's kind of a weird jukebox musical. Darling, you got to let me know. Should I stay or should I go? Yeah, about three times an episode, the characters will out of nowhere start narrating their feelings through various classic pop songs just cuz? It feels very jarring and out of pocket at first, but once you accept it, it actually gives the show a ton of its charm. The songs are delightfully staged and smartly chosen. I was often pleasantly surprised at how well the writers managed to make the lyrics line up with the story and characters. Blackpool is also unique in that instead of singing by themselves, the actors sing along with the original recordings of the songs, which you wouldn't expect to work, but it allows you to focus on the acting and visual storytelling rather than worry too much about anyone's singing ability. The musical numbers are hands down the best part of the show, and all the actors seem to have so much fun with them, especially David. The These Boots Are Made For Walkin' Scene is still one of the most iconic things I've seen in my entire life. I didn't love all of Blackpool. The central love triangle can be a bit tiringly tropey, and the story didn't always keep me invested, but I actually respect it more than I like it. It's honestly impressive that a show with a concept this unique and random even managed to get made, and it's an amusing little black sheep in David's filmography for sure. Sure. Cass 
Casanova. Oh my gosh, I love this show. It's so goofy and charming and campy and fun. And then it gets really depressing and kind of uncomfortable in the second half, but I still love it. Casanova has the honor of being the series that gave David Tennant a reputation for playing absolute harlots. I was actually expecting this show to be more explicit than it is based on the premise, but it's really not, at least compared to contemporary series of its ilk. For the most part, it's more like, and then scandalous thing happened. Cut to immediately after said scandalous thing happens. I have no doubt that a 2023 version of Casanova would be made with the primary purpose to be as shocking as possible. Gosh, imagine if Sam Levinson got his hands on this story. But thankfully, Russell T. Davies chose instead to focus on crafting an emotionally engaging story and characters. Nobody does camp with a heart better than Russell T. Davies, and I struggle to think of any writer with a better understanding of how best to use David's unique skill set. He's so baby in this, oh my god! Crafting a compelling protagonist out of history's most infamous man whore is no small feat, but Russell's always excellent character writing combined with David's star-making performance prove more than up to the task. Writing for The Decider, Megan O'Keefe describes David's Casanova as a masterclass in charm, and I could not have put it better myself. He's an utter delight to watch in this show, bursting off the screen with an irrepressible zest for life, pitch-perfect comedic timing, and a genuine innocence that makes Jack's antics dangerously easy to forgive. And you, sir, just consider, you love your wife. I love your wife. Aren't we both on the same side? By the end of the first episode, you'll be thinking, yeah, I'd let him seduce me too. Even if he does become a bit of a selfish bastard in the second half of the show, David always plays him with just enough heart to keep you rooting for him, in spite of the audience knowing it's impossible for this story to have a happy ending. It's painfully clear that the reason he keeps running all over Europe, leaving trouble in his wake, is because he's been denied the right to be with the one woman he truly loves by a world that hates people who try to rise above their station. Man, why can't David's characters ever stay innocent and happy the entire time. Why must you hurt me in this way? It's incredibly easy to see how David's Casanova performance led to him being cast as the 10th Doctor, and the characters bear some striking similarities. Both brilliant, far-traveled adventurers with a flair for the romantic and gargantuan amounts of hubris, whose staggering charisma and optimism ultimately can't save them from ending up desperately lonely. Casanova definitely isn't perfect, but it's glorious to watch what truly feels like the birth of a star in the making, and it's a seminal example of one of David's defining qualities as an actor, one you'll he reflected over and over throughout his career, his ability to find the human in the larger than life. Secret Smile before there was Kilgrave, there was Brendan Block. Secret Smile follows Miranda Cotton, played by Kate Ashfield, who, after going out with the seemingly charming Brendan for about a week, finds out he has committed multiple violations of her privacy and breaks up with him. Brendan then proceeds to date Miranda's sister instead in order to get back at her, weaseling his way back into her life in increasingly screwed up ways while slowly turning everyone in Miranda's life against her. Secret Smile was a last minute addition to my list as I had one or two commenters telling me I just had to see how utterly revolting David was in this show. If I'm being completely honest, I mostly just found this series really frustrating. You feel for Miranda as she tries desperately to warn the people she loves of Brendan's insidiousness in spite of everyone dismissing her as crazy, but everyone's sheer eagerness to believe Brendan over her frankly comes across as rather ridiculous. But at the same time, it doesn't help that she has multiple chances to be specific about why she doesn't trust him but doesn't. I mostly just think this series would have been more compelling and easy to buy if it had been longer than three episodes. It feels very rushed at times. Secret Smile does, however, give us a very interesting David performance. Interesting in that I hate Brendan Block's guts maybe more than I've hated any other character in David's filmography. Kilgrave at least has the decency to have a tragic backstory. There's no motivation given for Brendan's misdeeds other than pure depravity and selfishness. Basically, every moment he's on screen made me want to take a shower. He had numerous lines that made me scream into my pillow in sheer disgust, and with the exception of a couple of very outwardly malicious moments, he does it all with that easy, charming smirk on his face. The one David makes you love in other roles and absolutely loathe in this one. Well, this is by no means one of my favorite David performances. I was very impressed by just how much he managed to make me loathe this character. I barely saw David at all watching this series, and he actually managed to make me think more about how much I hated Brendan than how much I loved the actor playing him. Which is no small feat, considering this was at the height of David's pretty boyness. Pretty boy, with me, I said. Oh, I'm pretty boy. Yes. 
Potter and the Goblet of Fire. For most people, if Doctor Who wasn't your introduction to David Tennant, it was his performance in the fourth Harry Potter movie as twist villain Barty Crouch Jr., who spends the majority of the film disguised as Defense Against the Dark Arts professor Mad-Eye Moody, played by Brendan Gleeson. It definitely speaks to Harry Potter's status as a cultural powerhouse that even though he has at most three or four minutes of screen time in this movie, this role is still listed near the top of David's Wikipedia page. But it also speaks to David's ability to make even his smallest roles unforgettable. This is usually the first role I mention to people when they ask what David's been in, and they're always like, oh yeah, I remember him, he was crazy. With a sadistic gleam in his eye, a nasty flickering tongue, and his absolutely iconic delivery of, hello father. He's one of the series' most memorable secondary villains, and it's a delightful role to look back on in the context of the rest of his career. This was the first performance of his I ever watched at age 10, and seeing as I'm now arguably a bigger fan of David than I am of Harry Potter, I can't help but wish he'd gotten to make another appearance in later films. Oh well, you can't always get what you want. Recovery. Recovery is a difficult film to talk about because it is a film that brings me face to face with some of my deepest fears. Losing my individuality and agency as a result of an accident, becoming trapped in an unrewarding and soul-killing routine, and perhaps worst of all, the people I love becoming distant and unrecognizable. In Recovery, David plays Alan Hamilton, a man who suffers from memory loss as a result of a bus accident, which leaves him a fragmented shell of his former self and very nearly destroys his relationship with his wife, Trisha, played by Sarah Parrish, who you may recognize as one of David's other love interests, Natalie from Blackpool. The majority of this movie is incredibly difficult to watch, showing without restraint or sugarcoating the harrowing and exhausting emotional reality of loving, and often struggling to love, someone with severe amnesia. Some of the dialogue in this movie ranks among some of the rawest and most hard-hitting I've ever seen put to film, putting you right in the shoes of Alan as he flails blindly in search of a way to exist while missing key parts of himself, and of Trisha as she puts herself through hell for the slim chance that her husband will turn back into the man she loves, and not just a stranger who looks like him. You want to feel like a fucking widow anyway! This movie does ultimately have a deeply satisfying ending, but there were numerous times I was convinced it wasn't going to. This is not a movie you watch for fun. A year into his Doctor Who run, David was possibly the most talked about actor in the entire United Kingdom, which meant the stakes for his first major role in a post-Tenth Doctor world were through the roof. Everyone was eager to see if David was more than just Doctor Who. And while that is a rather patronizing statement, it's true that David's prominent roles up to this point had relied on a very particular brand. Who is David Tennant without his charm when you strip away the dramatic coats and witty comebacks and 10 carat grin? The answer is someone incredibly human, and it is his agonizing portrayal of Alan's journey towards rediscovering his humanity that makes recovery so compelling. While I usually am hyper aware of the fact that it's David playing a character as a result of my long-standing attachment to him, recovery may be the only project of David's where I've gotten so wrapped up in the story that for an extended period of time, I actually forgot it was him. His unpredictability is usually fun. Here, it's excruciating. The cruel things Alan's brain injury causes him to say and do can be incredibly uncomfortable to watch, and the scenes where he is cognizant of just how much he has lost and how much pain he is causing the people he loves rank among some of the most gut-wrenching moments I've ever seen put to film. Recovery is honestly such a powerful and quietly brilliant movie, and in any fair world, both David and Sarah Parrish would have received Oscar nominations for their performances, provided it received a wide release. I can't thank the person who uploaded the full film to YouTube enough, as without them it may very well have been lost forever since it's not available on DVD. It's a tough viewing, but so, so worth it, and a sobering but hopeful reminder of the frailty and preciousness of the human condition. Einstein and Eddington this movie's biggest crime was starring David Tennant and Andy Serkis and only having them meet within the last minute of the movie. Oh, but it's such a powerful moment when they do, though. But that just makes me even madder that we didn't get more. Oh, well, blame history, I guess. Einstein and Eddington follows the interconnecting storylines of Albert Einstein as he develops what will become the theory of relativity and Arthur Eddington, played by David, who goes from appointed challenger of Einstein's work to its staunchest supporter, struggling as a result to reconcile himself as a man of science and a man of faith. These sorts of tasteful British historical dramas do tend to be rather hit or miss for me, so I wasn't sure going in how much this movie would do for him. With David, it tends to be the darker and quirkier the better. But I was pleasantly 
pleasantly surprised, which by this point I really shouldn't be anymore. Wow, David Tennant is compelling in something. Must be Tuesday. Andy Serkis is equally excellent in this movie, by the way, but this video essay isn't about him. David's time as the 10th Doctor was in full swing when Einstein and Eddington was filming, and he lends that same timeless, piercing passion for the mysteries of the universe to Arthur Eddington, but veils it down to a quiet, dignified intensity. It's one of David's less chaotic, more elegant performances. No flailing limbs, no howls of madness, but that doesn't make it any less deeply felt. There's a cautious, trembling hope to David's performance, whether he's staking his career on a potentially earth-shattering proof, or hopelessly pining for his best friend as he departs for war. Which, oh my gosh, did I mention I am never emotionally prepared for how good David is at queer longing? I had no idea until I watched this movie that Arthur Eddington was heavily speculated to be gay. It was only when he's saying goodbye to William and the subtext starts subtexting that I was like, wait! So yeah, that's devastating. I also just love seeing David tackle roles involving religious themes. It's always interesting to hear him talk in interviews about how he's been positively and negatively influenced by his Scottish Presbyterian upbringing, and he brings such authenticity to characters grappling with these struggles in roles like this Inside Man and Good Omens. I wouldn't call Einstein and Eddington a must-watch, but it's an emotionally engaging look at one of the 20th century's unsung scientific heroes, and an excellent example of a gentler but no less captivating side to David's acting palette. Hamlet. What on earth can I say about David Tennant's Hamlet that hasn't already been said? If Doctor Who made David a household name, Hamlet established him as a generational talent, a force of unprecedented, unstoppable brilliance. It's the best performance of his career. Not his most iconic, not my favorite, but yes, the best. And in all honesty, probably in the top five greatest performances I've ever seen. In fact, I'm struggling to even come up with one that's better. Except maybe Sarah Lancashire and Happy Valley, with which David would probably agree with me. Well, at least Happy Valley's back, that's something. <laughs> Watching David in Hamlet leaves you with a more intimate knowledge of what he is capable of as an actor than possibly any of his other roles, with this titan of tragic heroes seeming almost a perfect microcosm for the full breadth of his dramatic range. You find yourself unable to passively listen, but forced to sit at rapt attention, utterly riveted every time he fixes his dagger-like gaze on the camera and pours his soul out to you like you're his closest friend. He is simply poetry in motion, raw and blistering, brash, daring, and defiant. A wild card on a resume full of wild cards. This performance has also only made me more certain that David desperately needs to play the titular role in Sweeney Todd. Like, you can't watch the coward soliloquy and tell me he would not blow Epiphany out of the absolute water. I will have vengeance! Who the hell needs No Fear Shakespeare when you've got an actor like David who makes prose fly off the page with such effortless virtue? virtuosity is to make every nuance understood to even the most uninformed audience members. He perfectly embodies the masterful, intuitive thinker, the chaotic class clown, the savage, vengeful madman, and perhaps most of all, the stunted and lonely child in a man's body, who viscerally aches to be loved, to be mourned, to be listened to. A quality that I think David does a phenomenal job bringing out in Hamlet is the fact that he is seen as mad because he speaks truth to power. This is a quality David has stated he admires in The Doctor, and it's one I believe he also has in spades. Ironically, for one of the great pretenders of our time, I can't think of a human being less phony than David Tennant. Unflinchingly honest and strong in his convictions, always using his voice to call BS where he sees it and stand up for the little guy. And it's this honesty that makes his Hamlet so complete compelling and easy to root for in spite of all his flaws, his insistence on the truth, his refusal to back down and be the perfect, obedient prince. There's such a gentleness to David's Hamlet, too, often in moments where you least expect it. I usually find myself cringing at the transparently cruel misogyny of get thee to a nunnery, but there's not a trace of malice in the words when David says them. He isn't slut-shaming Ophelia, he's pleading with her to save herself from him before it's too late. Hamlet is famously the wordiest role in any play in the English language, but he could have twice the amount of lines, and as long as it were David speaking them, I would eat up every single syllable. It's the kind of performance that makes you wonder why anyone else even bothers to take on the Danish prince. It's virtually impossible for me to imagine a better take on the character. No shade to Andrew Scott, though. I have heard very good things about him. And if you'll excuse me, I have to travel back in time to beg my AP English teacher to show this version of Hamlet in class instead of the 1996 one, because it's 
definitely not Kenneth Branagh's. He doesn't understand the character nearly as well as he thinks he does. Enjoy our first break in outfit continuity. I could have put my Doctor Who shirt back on, but I'm sorry, I like this one too much to take it off. It's serving Shive pirate energy. Single father. David Tennant shouldn't play normal people. His characters have to be epic. He needs to be playing brilliant, adventurous forces of personality or men of deep personal tragedy. He just isn't believable as your average Joe. Or at least that's what I thought before I watched Single Father. I of all people should have known how foolish it is to underestimate or impose limits upon David in any capacity. After all, one of the things I love most about David is how down-to-earth he is. He doesn't take a lot of roles in big-budget Hollywood movies because he doesn't want to be away from his family. And as a result, he's actually a lot less wealthy than most actors of his caliber. I mean, nine million is nothing to sneeze at, but he could have easily made quadruple that by now if he really wanted to. I've never heard a single sentence come out of David's mouth that sounded like it was put together by a PR team or came from anywhere other than straight from the heart. He's obviously still an extraordinary person who can't help but stand out, but he just genuinely seems to be a lot more in touch with reality than a lot of big name actors tend to be. And seeing a role that showed off that side of him was just lovely. I know absolutely nothing about this show before watching other than that it has David playing a depressed dad, but luckily I will watch David playing a depressed dad any day of the week. Single Father follows Dave Tyler, a photographer struggling to parent his five children after his partner Rita, who funnily enough shares an actress with Henriette from Casanova, dies in a motorcycle accident, as well as dealing with the moral complications of his burgeoning feelings for Rita's best friend, Sarah, played by Saran Jones. I've seen a lot of people call this series Hallmark movie-esque, which admittedly rang a bit true in the second half, with a little too much cheese and contrived drama for my liking. But the mostly terrific acting and dialogue keep everything just believable enough to be worth watching, and frankly, it's worth watching for David's performance alone. There's nothing particularly extraordinary about this character on the surface. He's not a genius, he doesn't have a particularly complicated psychology or a tragic backstory of Shakespearean proportions. He's just an ordinary man doing his best in a truly awful situation. But he's empathetic and gentle and funny and caring, and oh my gosh, does he look gorgeous in this white sweater. I am so damn bad. His performance in the first episode alone is just stunning, with Dave holding back his grief for weeks on end for the sake of his children and then breaking down in the last five minutes in possibly the most heartbreaking scene I've ever seen him do. I repeat, the most heartbreaking scene I've ever seen David freaking Tennant do. Note, I watched this before I watched Recovery, which has probably two scenes that are even more devastating than this one. In addition to David's performance, all of the child actors playing his kids are just delightful. I would die for little Evie. If anyone steals this series from David, it's her. Put your hand on her box, for fuck's sake. He said that <laughs> It's just so wholesome to see David and the kids play off each other. I obviously have no way of knowing for sure what kind of dad he is in real life, but if his interviews and his performance here are any indication, I bet he's absolutely wonderful. The Decoy Bride. I was on fence for a while about whether or not I should watch this movie, as it's one of David's worst reviewed projects, and I'm not much of a rom-com person. But then all my friends who'd seen it were like, you should watch it! It's so cute! And David has an iconic outfit! Which boy does he ever! So I watched it, and oh my gosh, this movie is so goofy, you guys. The Decoy Bride stars David as James Arbor, a dreamy but rather objectively terrible romance author engaged to Lara Tyler, the world's hottest actress, and the always delightful Kelly MacDonald as Katie, our down-to-earth and down-on-her luck Scottish heroine, who in a farcical turn of events winds up masquerading as Lara and marrying James in order to protect the couple's wedding from the press. The movie's paced rather weirdly and doesn't have a lot of plot momentum. There's a few jokes that didn't age well, and it's obviously not the most realistic thing ever, but it's not nearly as bad as Rotten Tomatoes made it out to be, and by rom-com standards, there were honestly a lot fewer red flags than I was expecting. David's knack for making you like characters you really shouldn't honestly makes him a surprisingly ideal fit for rom-coms, and as predicted, he makes James more endearing than he has any right to be. There's definitely still a few red flags to be had with him, mainly his initially comical levels of self-obsession, but nothing that isn't called out by the story itself, and David plays him with the perfect
perfect combination of petulance and sweetness. Kelly MacDonald is also just so charming in this movie, and thanks to her and David's performances, you almost buy that James would realize he needs to break up with his beautiful and famous fiance after spending just one day with Katie. At least he doesn't cheat on her. I'll give the movie points for not romanticizing infidelity. Thank you very much. The movie benefits greatly from having a genuinely fantastic and adorable ending that, yes, did have me squealing and swooning to my heart's content. That smile! Side note, but I just think it's really funny that David doesn't use his native accent in this movie because he and Kelly MacDonald are maybe the two most aggressively Scottish actors I can think of. Like, I think if they'd both gotten to use their accents, the screen would have exploded from sheer Scottishness. So yeah, Decoy Bride is pretty cute. Watch it if you want to see David play bagpipes. Fright Night. I was also debating whether or not to watch this movie because it isn't on any streaming services I already have and vampire horror comedy isn't my usual genre wheelhouse, but in the end I caved because I knew that if I didn't I was gonna have like 10 of you guys in my comments section yelling, WHERE'S PETER VINCENT?! A remake of the 1995 cult classic of the same name, Fright Night definitely suffers from a bit of the misogyny and tropiness of similar movies of its genre and time period, but I mostly still enjoyed it thanks to its stylish direction, humor-driven screenplay, and very charming cast, especially David, who doesn't show up in the flesh for the first 45 minutes, but once he does, of course manages to steal the movie completely, and also drop more F-bombs than maybe the entire rest of his career combined. An on-screen vampire hunter turned aggressively goth Vegas magician, Peter Vincent is maybe the sluttiest character on David's resume. The most fun thing about this movie for me was just how many of Crowley's mannerisms can be traced back to Peter Vincent. The speech patterns, the way he holds a glass of whiskey, the now iconic tight leather pants walk, the aggressively bisexual sitting. Crowley is definitely the more likable character of the two. Peter, while not evil, is probably one of David's more red flaggy characters. He's kind of a major asshole to his girlfriend and near the end of the movie he randomly kisses Charlie, who's like 17. I mean, Slay, I guess? He's clearly emotionally stunted due to the murder of both of his parents, but though David, of course, does a great job bringing out those shades in his performance, the movie doesn't do quite as much with this as I would have wanted it to. Oh well, if nothing else, David's ability to exude cocky, sarcastic, flamboyant, burnout rock star energy in leather pants and guy liner is demonstrable proof that he desperately needs to play Shakespeare in something run. It's sexy, but it's hot! Much Ado About Nothing. After watching Inside Man, Casanova, Single Father, Hamlet, and Einstein and Eddington in that order, I was in desperate need of something where I did not have to worry about David hurting my feelings. And after five tear-jerking performances in a row, oh my gosh, this was such a breath of fresh air. It healed my soul in every way imaginable and then made me cry anyway because the Beatrice and Benedict kiss reminded me how single I am. Overall, a near perfect production of possibly my new favorite Shakespeare comedy, featuring a delightfully tacky 80s aesthetic, all the spontaneous group dance numbers you could want, seamless balancing of sides splitting slapstick and genuinely gut-wrenching pathos, and of course, David and Catherine's sublime characterizations of our favorite banter buddies to lovers. First of all, kudos to Catherine Tate for being one of the only actors capable of actually taking my attention off of David for five minutes because damn her kill Claudio was riveting! Donna has always been my favorite Doctor Who companion, and she and David's onstage rapport is truly the stuff dreams are made of. If by some miracle David does end up starring in Sweeney Todd at some point, she had better be his Mrs. Lovett. Anyways, back to the David of it all, because this is hands down my favorite predominantly comedic performance of his career. I adore David's Benedict. He so perfectly captures his journey from cynical, carefree loner to fully embracing his sincere and passionate love for Beatrice. Nowhere is this showcased better than his utterly hysterical hysterical soliloquy in Act 2, Scene 3. It's an utter delight to watch him just transform into this deliriously giddy, lovesick little boy before your very eyes. For I will be horribly in love with her! He's just such a pathetic dork. Never let it be said that David Tennant cannot play himbos. But as always with David, there's a lot more to this performance than wiggly limbed pratfalls and ridiculous outfits. It's easy to forget due to Much Ado's lighthearted tone that Benedict has in fact spent years in combat. And in the play's more serious moments, David imbues him with a cool level-headed reason that you can tell he has gained as a result of his experience. When necessary, there's a patience and steadiness to him that the other characters lack. When Beatrice pours her heart out of how profoundly Claudio has wronged her cousin, he forgoes larger reactions and simply listens. 
You spend the first half of the play in stitches at his clumsiness and witticisms, but when he's holding Leonardo back from striking Hero or challenging Claudio to defend her honor, he's chillingly serious. And it's so easy to see ultimately why Beatrice falls in love with him as the only man in the play who respects and is willing to fight for the woman's side of the story. It's difficult to think of a role where David looks like he's having a more delightful time than he is in Much Ado About Nothing, especially during the final dance sequence, which left me smiling bigger than I probably probably have in months. How can a man be so suave yet so silly at the same time? Watching David as Benedict is watching a man discover the wild euphoric joy of caring, of having someone to cherish and laugh with and protect. In the words of the man himself, And what could be finer? And now I'm off to go think about David air guitaring with his leg for the foreseeable rest of time. <laughs> Broadchurch. Let's get this out of the way immediately. In spite of my grievances with Chris Chibnall for somehow managing to temporarily make me stop caring about one of the first pieces of media I ever truly loved, Broadchurch is a fantastic freaking show, with an overarching exploration of grief, trauma, and healing every bit as engrossing as its brilliantly crafted mysteries. It boasts some of the most astounding and believable performances ever captured on television. I want to personally hug the genius who put David Tennant and Olivia Colman, two of the absolute greatest acting talents of their generation, in a show together. Thank you, Kelly Valentine Hendry! Broad Church would be many people's pick for David's definitive non-doctor performance, and they'd be right to think so, with perhaps one or two truly formidable rivals, in my opinion. But what I find so fascinating about Broad Church is just what an impactful and unprecedented series it is in the context of David's career. It's strange to think about in 2023, but at the time, the character of D.I. Alec Hardy went against just about everything David was to people. Prior to Broadchurch, and arguably still, David was seen as a maximalist actor. Almost all of his major roles, with a couple of exceptions, relied on his wild, boundless theatrical energy. I'd describe David's image prior to Broadchurch as almost Peter Pan-like. Witty, charming, cheerful, and eternally boyish. Everything that grumpy, cynical, exhausted Alec Hardy isn't. When Broadchurch came out, critics simply couldn't stop talking about how utterly unlike the Tenth Doctor Alec Hardy was. He's been perpetually 28 for the past 12 years. Now all of a sudden he's got a beard and looks his age. And then everyone was like, wow, David is really good at playing sad, brooding dads in crime dramas. And now that's his typecast. Think about that. David played against type so well that it became his new type. Oh, Alec Hardy, our favorite man of constant, aggressively Scottish sorrow. Where characters like Campbell, Casanova, and Ten were free-spirited, buoyant, light on their feet, one look at Alec instantly tells you that this is a man carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders, burdened and beaten down by his failures as both a policeman and a father. Where they were all figures of optimism and idealism, Alec lives seemingly without hope, grown accustomed to living each day as an act of penance. For the first time, David appeared physically worn and hardened by marks of intense stress, bearing dark shadows under his eyes and cheekbones, his once lilting and youthful vocal timbre turned gravity and rough, his whole body brittle with tension. The eyes have never been more important than they are with Alec Hardy, dark and stained with guilt and loneliness as though at any moment he could shatter and burst into tears and gosh, I just want to give this man a hug. David's signature intensity is by no means diminished with Alec, rather veiled down to a quiet burning simmer, an all-consuming drive for justice that both wills Alec to survive and nearly kills him. The personality he presents is all steel and sandpaper and bitter black coffee but at heart, Alec really is just an extremely burnt marshmallow. He's the epitome of not nice, but kind, showing at best no patience and at worst frightening wrath to anyone who dares obstruct the course of justice, but at the same time showing such subtly gentle compassion to the victims of crime he is charged with defending, even if he doesn't always know how to show it. Alec Hardy tries with every bone in his body to do the right thing, and he so often comes up tragically short, but he never stops trying. So often with David's roles, I like to look for interesting intersections between his personal life and the characters he plays, and in this show, I find it so poignant to contemplate how David must have felt portraying Alec's struggles with fatherhood in the third season. When charged with putting away a serial rapist, Alec is forced to confront the absolute worst 
impulses of manhood, all while his own daughter is dealing with a humiliating incident of sexual harassment. Every time you see him encountering pornography or situations of sexual violence, or watch him listening with disgust as a suspect tells him about having sex with a 19-year-old girl in the woods and has the audacity to say that he'd do it too if he had the chance, there's a constant undercurrent of righteous fury that this is the world that he has to send his daughter out into. A father of four children at the time of filming, including two little girls, I have no doubt that when Alec viciously lays into the boys who dared to leak photos of Daisy, a part of that's David too. Broadchurch, to me, is the series that represents David growing up a powerful, profound, and personal turning point in his career. One of my favorite moments in all of Broadchurch comes in one of the final scenes, as Ellie is crying after the rapist has been discovered. Alec comes over to comfort her, and he says, He is not what men are. He's an aberration. <sighs> I hope so. For all his faults, the world needs more Alec Hardys, and it certainly needs more David Tennant's. The Escape Artist. The Escape Artist, for which David won a Scottish BAFTA in 2014, follows Will Burton, a brilliant defense barrister with a perfect track record of getting his clients acquitted. Man, David really seems to love playing geniuses. When getting off the wrong client results in tragedy striking Will's family, everything he believes in is called into question, and he must use his intimate knowledge of the system that failed him in order to pursue justice on his own terms. I think The Escape Artist would have benefited from one extra episode, as I didn't feel like I had quite enough time to fully invest in the story. But it does have a genuinely show-stopping final twist, and it poses some fascinating moral questions about whether those who help acquit murderers are equally responsible for the crimes committed by them, and what, if anything, gives someone the right to take another person's life, though I do think these questions deserve to be explored a bit further. I went into this series expecting Will Burton to be a much more cold and morally dark character than he actually was, largely due to the primary marketing image for this series being David doing a Kubrick stare in handcuffs. He's in a morally dark situation to be sure, but at least the way David plays him, he strikes me as a fundamentally decent human being, albeit one whose circumstances force him to detach from his personal morals. The characters in David's repertoire he reminded me of most were Dave Tyler from Single Father and Harry Watling from Inside Man, all three devoted parents and men of character who find themselves caught in webs of varying moral dubiosity. My favorite scenes in the series were those shared between Will and his son Jamie. David makes you viscerally feel just how much Will worries for and wants to protect Jamie, and it's so clear that everything he does is ultimately for him, which made it nigh impossible for me to blame him for the actions he takes in the finale. Will is on the more subtle end of the spectrum of David's characters, but as much as I do miss the classic David meltdown, it's just as compelling to watch him fight the urge to have one, whether for the sake of Jamie or the professional image he's forced to maintain. And of course, it's beautiful to watch him tackle legal arguments with such dignity and finesse, especially his final speech, which he does with beautifully controlled rage and urgency. It's a deep deeply felt and thought-provoking performance, just one that fell a teeny bit short on the catharsis factor for me. Richard II. Unlike Hamlet and Much Ado About Nothing, I'd had no prior reading or viewing experience with Richard II, so I had to watch slash read a few summaries in order to understand the story. And what surprised me was just how unsympathetic Richard II seems intended to come across on paper. He's vain, fatally careless with the lives of his subjects, and entitled by divine right to the crown in spite of proving over and over he isn't worthy of it. And yet, as I watched David play him, he was deeply and consistently sympathetic. There's such a profound innocence to his Richard that comes through in his delicate, keening voice and open, curious eyes. He is, for all intents and purposes, a child who makes cruel and irresponsible decisions because he has never been taught any other way to be. No deeper wrinkles yet. <laughs> Hath sorrow struck so many blows upon this face of mine and left no deeper wound. <laughs> Flattering glass. David plays Richard with the desperate insecurity of someone who has never had a chance to define himself outside of what has been handed to him since birth, and who once he loses that is left with nothing. No purpose, no identity, and worst of all, no friends. In the Let Us Talk of Graves soliloquy, you see just how much he craves someone who might love him for him, without the crown. Unconditional, honest connection without fear or a desire to flatter. It's utterly devastating to see him believe he's found that with O'Merle, only to in the end be betrayed by the one person he believed he could trust and be vulnerable with. 
I've seen David's physical image in the final act of the play be described as Christ-like, with his flowing hair and robes and borderline angelic countenance, which makes this turn of the story all the more poignant. David has cited Richard II as a dream role ever since seeing Derek Jacobi play the character while in drama school, and his empathy and compassion for him is exquisitely clear, resulting in a performance that combines ugly, humiliating indignity with the fragile glory of shattered stained glass. What we did on our holiday. I was excited to watch this movie because it had David playing opposite the always excellent Rosamund Pike. And after the harrowing endeavor that was Jessica Jones, which believe me, we will get to, I needed something a bit more wholesome. And eh? The plot of this movie was definitely not what I expected it to be. What we did on our holiday follows Doug and Abby, David and Roz, and their three children's trip to Northern Scotland for Doug's father, Gordy, played by Billy Connolly's birthday party. Doug and Abby are attempting to keep the fact that they're getting divorced hidden from the rest of the family because Gordy is dying of cancer. And here's where things get interesting. Gordy dies while on the trip with the kids to the beach and the kids remember that he asked for a Viking funeral. So they put his body on a boat and burn it. Anyways, this ends up triggering a whole media circus, which ends up exposing the family's dysfunction, lessons are learned by all, yada, yada, yada. The movie itself wasn't disappointing. It's funny and poignant with good enough writing and performances, even though the second half felt very rushed. David's performance, on the other hand, this is maybe his only major role where he actually kind of fades into the background. He's usually such a force of personality that you can't help but pay attention to him, but Rosamund Pike, Billy Connolly, the kids, even the pretentious brother get more interesting and dramatic scenes than he does. It just really doesn't feel like his movie at all in spite of him getting second highest billing. And this is notably the only thing I've watched for David where none of the top letterbox reviews specifically highlight his performance. Seriously, I cannot emphasize enough how eager David fans usually are to just scream about his performance online. We are an unhinged little band. There are some nice subtle moments of inner turmoil, but they don't really build to anything, which is unfortunate because David is nothing if not the king of the cathartic emotional payoff. And to add insult to injury, there are at least two scenes where you think he's going to have a big emotional payoff, but it gets interrupted by one of the other characters having one. I said in my single father segment that I no longer necessarily think David is wasted playing normal people, but unfortunately that is kind of the case here as he just doesn't really get a chance to bring any of the sweetness, humor, or pathos that he brought to Dave Tyler. Oh well, at least the scene at the end with Abby and the kids is adorable. Give me more of that, please! And now for our second break in outfit continuity! I'm not out of Doctor Who shirts just yet. I just realized all of my room decor is Kilgrave colored. I don't know how to feel about that. Jessica Jones. While I can't speak for the quality of the rest of the series, as for now I've only watched what was necessary for the purposes of this video, I absolutely loved season one of Jessica Jones. It's definitely not perfect, but it nonetheless boasts some of the finest writing I've ever seen in a Marvel production. A deeply compelling anti-heroine in Kristen Ritter's Jessica, a dark and painfully believable exploration of PTSD and self-loathing, and one of the greatest TV villains of all time in David Tennant's Kilgrave. Dear God, I'd do anything to see the look in her face when she realizes she's helpless. I'd make her want me, then reject her, devastate her over and over and over until she wants to die. She'd wither away like someone dying of thirst or starvation. Be a certain ring of hell designed specially for her. Or maybe I'd just kill her. This series is a bona fide masterclass in how to build up a character as a terrifying threat that haunts every moment of the story. Even before Kilgrave makes a proper in-the-flesh appearance, his presence is chillingly felt. The first few episodes are spent giving us tiny glimpses of Kilgrave, gradually ratcheting up the horror of his powers, little by little showing us more and more, until the moment he finally shows himself fully on screen leaves you quivering with dread. Watching Jessica Jones specifically for David Tennant is a risky undertaking, one that often made me feel like a bad feminist. As a woman watching this series about a strong, traumatized heroine, the fact that so much of my attention was focused on the man who manipulates and torments her, it had to be so I could write this, 
made me feel quite guilty. Jessica Jones is without a doubt a show for grown-ups, not only because of the violence and disturbing themes, but because it takes a certain level of maturity to separate a character like Kilgrave from the actor playing him. I've thankfully never been the type to swoon over unrepentant murderers, but as a lifelong fan of David, I'm somewhat predisposed to hone in on and love every character he plays and Damn it, he almost makes you love Kilgrave, too. He's a vile, repulsive, predatory, cruel human being. And yet there are flashes of charm, wit, tenderness, all the things you love about David and his other roles that make it incredibly tempting to fall for him. I frequently had to snap myself out of it every time he flashes one of those signature smiles or speaks in that classically alluring David manner, employing a do not swoon chant every time I could feel my defenses slipping. I can see how many could view the casting of Kilgrave with such an innately likable actor as irresponsible, even dangerous, but in my opinion, it's necessary. If all of the evil people in the world were ugly, and uncharismatic, our lives would be so much easier because we'd be less likely to fall into their traps. I think it's brilliant to take the qualities that have made David such an endearing hero and turn them on their head for nefarious, manipulative purposes. And besides, just when you start to find yourself growing attached to him against your will, he's kind enough to reverse redeem himself with an act so disgusting and monstrous you'll be right back in the comfortable certainty of screaming in horror at your television. Every moment Kilgrave is on screen leaves you on edge. You're constantly waiting for something to set him off, for what horrific thing he's going to make someone do to themselves or someone else next. He's like a human train wreck. You can't look, but you can't look away. The contrast between David's villain performances, of which Kilgrave is undoubtedly his most iconic, and his real-life personality makes these roles all the more fascinating for him. In a promotional interview for Bad Samaritan, which I sadly didn't get to watch because it wasn't available on streaming, director Dean Devlin described David as the sweetest man I've ever worked with in my life, lauding his ability to turn on the creep factor at the drop of a hat, then go right back to his friendly, generous self the second the camera stopped rolling. I think David's now natural kindness makes him even more suited to playing villainous characters. He doesn't need to go method asshole, take notes Jared Leto. What he brings to these roles is empathy. It takes a lot of compassion to be able to engage with horrible people like Kilgrave as human beings. You can tell Kilgrave sincerely believes that he loves Jessica. There's a naivety and openness to his twisted affection for her that can be incredibly disarming. But it's all rooted in how out of touch with reality and lacking in empathy he is. He's so used to having people do whatever he wants that he's never had to learn how to put himself in other people's shoes. You once again see how excellent he is at playing the emotionally stunted child in a man's body. So many of Kilgrave's most frightening moments read like pathetic juvenile tantrums with a body count. He's the king of weaponized vulnerability, fully aware of the power of his tragic backstory to absolve him of responsibility for his actions. You can tell David was having a blast in every scene of this show, turning in one of his most commanding, dynamic, gloriously unhinged performances to date. He and Kristen Ritter are absolute dynamite together. Seriously, I know this video is about David, but Kristen's performance deserves so much more credit than it gets. And the fact that neither of them were nominated for Emmys really is just all the proof I need that award shows just have beef with genre television. Well, I thankfully did not succumb to Kilgrave's proverbial mind control, he's still one of my absolute favorite characters in David's film. Filmography, a psychotic, fascinating, infuriatingly magnetic monster that I love. To hate. Voice acting roles. One of my favorite things about David has always been his voice. That instantly recognizable Scottish brogue, musical, mercurial, and mischievous, salty and sweet, crackling like coals in a fireplace. At least, those are just a few of the numerous adjectives Fiona and I came up with during one of our many late night brain rot sessions. So it's no surprise that in addition to his live action roles, David has also racked up an impressive voiceover resume. David is an amazing voice actor, perfectly adapting the pitch and texture of his voice to suit the character, though that unmistakable cadence is nearly always there to tip you off. One of the reasons I think David should take a stab at musical theater is that he has a massive vocal range. David is undeniably a tenor, with his speaking voice, at least in his younger years, sitting comfortably around a C3 to C5 range. You were only on film. Oh, yeah! 
but it's also deepened and evolved beautifully over the years. Listen to him here in Vox Machina. He can play grizzled baritone baddies with the best of them. To tell you the truth, I was certain you would die the moment you met the mighty Brimside. That it seems some vermin are harder to kill than others. The first voice role I ever saw David in was Charles Darwin in 2012's Pirates Band of Misfits, who is such a mood, oh my gosh. I'll never get a girlfriend. I am so unhappy. It's a treat to see David bring this awkward, nervous energy to a character after making a name for himself playing confident charmers. I highly recommend watching the recording footage and interviews for this movie on YouTube. He's wonderfully expressive in the booth and so complimentary and respectful to the animators who helped bring this gem of a movie to life. One of David's most acclaimed voice roles to date is his Emmy-winning performance as Hu Yang in Star Wars The Clone Wars, which I was so excited to discover he reprised this year in Ahsoka. I obviously didn't have time to watch Clone Wars for this video since David is only in three episodes and I'm not super into Star Wars, but I did watch all of the scenes of his that are on YouTube and he's absolutely sublime. His delivery a perfect mixture of Anthony Daniels' anxious poshness with a dash of that classic 10th Doctor wit and mystique. It's very impressive how he manages to be totally believable as a robot while still being emotionally expressive at the same time. R2, do something! I don't know, we have to shake Grievous off! Get aggressive! What if the funniest things about David's voice acting career to me is that while he's often asked to mask his accent in live action roles, his voice acting roles often require him to be as Scottish as humanly possible. I don't know you, but I'm not scared of you, you sorry sack of meat! You're an affront to my nostrils! <laughs> I think it's absolutely hilarious that David Tennant has voiced not one, but two token Scottish guys named Angus. The other being his character in the Loud House movie, which I didn't watch because people said it was bad, but oh my gosh, Angus number two is so adorable, I would die for him. He also gets a whole ass musical number in this movie, and he full on belts a G, like, okay, king. <laughs> my loads, at last you've returned! David also gets to be aggressively Scottish as the narrator of the How to Train Your Dragon audiobooks, as well as the movies, where he voices Snotlout's dad. His role in the movies is basically a glorified cameo, but he gets slightly more to do in the show. Look, they gave him a little dance! David even gets a very dramatic 30-second cameo in the Clone High reboot. I absolutely love this for him. It's like he's joined the Morgan Freeman club of actors you pick if you just need someone with a really cool voice. I'm David Tennant. Give money. But of course, I have saved David's best and most Scottish voice role for last. I am sharper than the sharpies. I am tougher than the toughies. I am Scrooge McDuck. Duck tails. Woo! -hoo. David Tennant as Scrooge McDuck is just such inspired casting on so many levels. Of course, I think putting David in literally anything is inspired casting. Why else do you think I'm writing this video essay? But he just fits so perfectly into the Casanova 10th Doctor Phileas Fogg brilliant dashing adventurer pipeline, which is probably the closest thing David actually has to an identifiable typecast. I watched the first season or so of DuckTales when it originally came out, specifically for David, even though I'd never seen the original, but I sadly never had time to watch the rest though I did rewatch a bunch of clips for the sake of this video. I really should finish it at some point because this show has excellent comedic writing, which David, of course, makes an absolute meal out of. I can just picture the scriptwriters of this show coming up with certain lines and thinking, oh my gosh, David is going to have so much fun with this. Jettison that jalopy from my driveway this instant your dad's beat! And of course, he gets to be gloriously, astonishingly Scottish. With a rich Celtic tradition connected to but entirely distinct from the rest of the United Kingdom. In addition to the humor, David also gives Scrooge a great deal of depth and heart and brings such weight and gravitas to the series' dramatic moments. He makes you feel every bit of the regret and loss buried beneath Scrooge's unflappable exterior and the deep love he has for his family in spite of how often he pushes them away. I hope you're happy. I am. It's yet another perfect example of David's knack for finding humanity in the larger than life even when the character in question is a duck. Mad to be normal. David says murder in the opening scene of this movie, and that's the best part of the entire thing. There's been a murder. 
Yeah, this is kind of my least favorite thing David's ever been in. It wasn't even originally on my list, but it was on Amazon Prime and I saw that it had Elizabeth Moss in it, which immediately sold me as I was incredibly intrigued to see David star alongside such an equally brilliant actress. I really wanted to like this movie, but the whole thing just felt so aimless. I got more than an hour in and it still felt like nothing had happened. Mad to be normal tells the true story of controversial, vaguely cult leader-esque psychiatrist R.D. Lang, which by all accounts seems like it should be a fascinating role for David, with him being specifically drawn to playing this character after watching an unrelated play featuring him. But the movie is paced in such a way that it makes it nearly impossible to get invested in any of the already barely likable characters. All of the scenes in this movie just seem to happen one after the other with no sense of momentum or story progression. There's some thought-provoking themes and moments that are compelling in a vacuum, but they lack the necessary connected tissue to really work. Seriously, I cannot emphasize enough how little of an actual plot this movie has. It's so bad that the Wikipedia page doesn't even have an actual summary of the movie. It was the last 20 minutes of the movie before I felt anything other than a vague sense of ickiness. I actually considered just throwing in the towel multiple times, but I'm ultimately glad I didn't, as David does have one really excellent scene towards the end of the movie where Ronnie has to tell his own daughter she's dying of leukemia, and she asks him if he believes in life after death. It's genuinely heartbreaking, well-written, and of course, beautifully acted. Elizabeth Moss has some terrific moments in the second half as well, both on her own and with David, and I would love to see them be in another, better movie together. Watch the last 30 minutes if you want to see David and Liz killing it, but otherwise, skip this one. It's really not worth your time. Deadwater Fell. I could very well be alone in this, but Deadwater Fell is the other David Tennant project that didn't really do anything for me, and if I had to pick a least favorite David performance slash character, it's most likely Tom Kendrick. It's certainly not a bad performance, I don't think his talent or work ethic would remotely allow for that, and it's not even noticeably worse than anything else he's done. It's just that there's not really a lot in this character that lets him shine or gives him a chance to do anything that he doesn't do better in other projects. It's one of his only characters where him being played by David didn't make any difference in my overall enjoyment of the project. He kind of just could have been played by anybody, which is such an odd feeling because with pretty much all of David's other roles, I wouldn't want to see anybody else play them. Spoilers ahead in case you were thinking of checking this show out. This series follows Jess Milner, played very well by Kush Jumbo, as she investigates the fire that killed Tom's family, eventually discovering that the fire was started by Tom himself. I like to joke that this show uses David's sad dad and crime drama pedigree to lure the audience into a false sense of security, but that's sadly where the interest ends for me. Jess does make for a solid lead, but Tom just isn't a very compelling character to me. He's not particularly sympathetic when you think he's supposed to be a protagonist, and you don't get enough time for him to be very memorable as a villain either. I literally cannot remember any lines he has in this show, even after re-watching multiple scenes. <laughs> You're so banal! You're so fucking banal! I've seen and loved plenty of David's darker roles, but the thing about Tom is that he's worse than a horrible person. He's a dull, horrible person. I can practically hear the director saying, okay, David, for the first time in literally your entire career, you are not allowed to be charming at all. Your character shall be a black hole of charisma and likability. I suppose that is kind of an interesting aspect of the show. Like, can the most vibrant, sparkling man in all of Great Britain believably play this absolute nothing of a human being? And to his credit, he does. I do think it's funny that the promotional material for this series is clearly banking so hard on David's performance being a selling point. Like all of Channel 4 Entertainment scenes from this show on YouTube are titled things like powerful scene with David Tennant and dramatic David Tennant acting. As if he isn't powerful and dramatic in basically every single show he does, like chill, he's only using 10% of his powers. Also, why the heck did people keep saying this show was the next broad church? Like, mate, no it's not. I think I just got burned out of seeing David play these evil and not in a fun way characters. Seeing as I watched Dez very soon after I watched this show, wow, the pandemic was not a fun time for David. Speaking of which, Staged. Arguably one of the most enduring artistic experiments of the pandemic, Staged is the apparent result of Simon Evans thinking, you know what we need more of in these trying times? David Tennant and Michael Sheen's concerningly fantastic chemistry. If Good Omens hadn't already cemented David and Michael as the internet's favorite middle-aged Gaelic dad bromance, then Staged certainly did, with many of the series' moments continuing to be viral staples on social media. You did not paint that this morning. Yes, I did. You did not paint that this morning. I 
did. I don't believe you. You drew the pineapple. My pineapple is shit. Well, it just needs a bit of shading. Oh, shut up. The first season of Staged was lightning in a bottle, striking the perfect balance of laugh out loud humor and restless melancholy to be the perfect uncomfortable comfort show for the COVID-19 era. It doesn't quite manage to maintain that level of freshness due to the changing times with later episodes getting a bit exhaustingly meta for my taste, but it all gets tied up in such a thematically fitting bow that I'm totally willing to forgive its stumbles, even if the ending is a little too similar to the ineffable divorce. Acting as oneself can be a deceptively tricky endeavor, and the level of casual intimacy and spontaneity that David and Michael manage to convey through their laptop cameras is a testament to both of their staggering talents. For better or worse, Staged has played a major role in strengthening the parasocial relationship Michael and David's fans have with them, with the series giving the viewer an opportunity to get to know them on a much more personal level than one would the majority of actors. Of course, at the end of the day, Staged is still, well, staged. I highly doubt the real David has ever let himself be as petty and ego-driven as he portrays himself in this show. Okay, maybe not ever, but at least not as often. But the series also gives a window into what I now know to be some of David's very real fears of being unoriginal, of people growing tired of him. Something I can absolutely relate to as an actor with a similar personality type. Forming three gang! Whatever its faults, Staged is a terrific showcase of David and Michael's willingness to be their most uninhibited, unrehearsed, and at times unflattering selves, whether for humor or pathos. And it's an undeniable important piece of their now inextricably linked careers. Des. A wise person once said, a good actor will know how to endear themselves to an audience. A great actor will know how to do that as well, but they will also know when not to. That wise person was me. I just made that up. David's performance as serial killer Dennis Nielsen in the true crime miniseries Des is one of the most critically acclaimed roles of his career, earning him a National Television Award and an International Emmy Award for Best Actor. And for a while, I didn't really understand why. The cynic in me saw it as yet another example of how much award shows seem to love it when a likable actor with mass appeal all of a sudden decides to transform themselves into the absolute worst humanity has to offer. I think of David's Dennis Nielsen as sort of the anti-David Tennant performance. There's no breakdown, no epic speech, not even really any moments of overt, obvious wickedness. Just a complete nothing of a man, almost entirely devoid of the wit, charm, and energy that characterize almost all of David's other performances. It's always been one of the roles that stood out the least to me because, well, it's the one that's the least him. But then it hit me. That's the point. Watching any interview with David for this series makes one thing crystal clear. He does not want you to find Dennis Nielsen fascinating. In his own words, he's not Hannibal Lecter. He's just some bloke. Just some bloke who did some of the worst things a human being could ever possibly do to multiple other human beings and then spoke about it in the most bland, lifeless, disgustingly ordinary manner. Des doesn't set out to make one of the most vile criminals in recent memory a compelling and sympathetic character or use his horrific deeds for shock value. Rather, it warns us of the horrors that can take place right under our noses when we neglect the most vulnerable in society, and reveals that sometimes under the mystique, evil people are just really boring. David's performance in Des is a masterclass in letting go of your ego for the sake of the story being told, of one of the most likable and interesting actors I can think of, resisting the urge to be likable and interesting because it's not about him. It's still definitely not one of my favorite roles of his. I'd be concerned for anybody who said it was, but it's absolutely one of the ones I have the most respect for. Around the World in 80 Days. I've unfortunately never read Jules Verne's novel, so I may not be the most qualified person to judge, but I really enjoyed Around the World in 80 Days, a lot more than I was expecting to. It's gorgeously designed, funny, not all of the attempts to make the source material more progressive work, but enough of them do. It's very easy to get invested in the central trio, and they have great chemistry once they warm up to each other, and it boasts a surprisingly moving emotional core, largely thanks to the impeccable casting of David Tennant as our unlikely globetrotting hero, Phileas Fogg. I was already very much looking forward to watching this show, for obvious reasons. However, what surprised me, although it really shouldn't because David always does this to me, is how genuinely invested I became in Phileas Fogg and the literal and emotional journey he takes throughout the show. David has something of a reputation for playing clever, intrepid, adventurous characters, so it's a delightful subversion to see him play a character who, at first, is 
kind of terrible at that, but who grows into that role over the course of the story. This really is just the perfect show to watch if you like seeing David Tennant being put into situations. You get David vomiting off the edge of a ship, David being absolutely bonkers while high on Datura seeds, David kicking a racist in the nuts. Wow, this show has everything. Phileas Fogg is at first a rather frustrating protagonist. He's pompous, self-absorbed, out of touch, and above all, doesn't seem to possess much of a spine. But David so beautifully embodies the profound insecurity and self-loathing of a man resigned to a life of missed connections and comfortable mediocrity, a man who harbors such exquisitely deep feelings but whose station forces him to repress them. There's such tenderness to David's Phileas, so much longing conveyed through his voice quavering on a particular word or his eyes glistening with unshed tears. He undergoes such a glorious transformation as he grows in conviction, confidence, and inner joy. By the end of the series, the true Phileas reveals himself to be resourceful, imaginative, compassionate, daring, and incredibly courageous, a hero in every sense of the word, though still a bit of a pathetic dork. He's also possible one of the best single role showcases of David's versatility. When I say he has not one but two Emmy-worthy monologues in episode four alone, I'm not remotely exaggerating. I would honestly die for Phileas. He's easily one of the most endearing and swoon-worthy characters in David's filmography, and the show itself is just such a fun and investing comfort watch too. I'm thrilled that it's been picked up for a second season, and I can't wait to see more of Phileas, Passepartout, and Abigail's adventures. Please go give it a watch. Inside Man. Inside Man, in spite of coming last on my list chronologically, was actually the first new thing I watched with David when I began my filmography deep dive, as I became incredibly eager to see it after watching a clip of the series resident David Tennant losing it scene on YouTube. I have acted out of love! I have acted out of duty! The consensus on Inside Man as a series is mixed, to say the least. It's written by Stephen Moffat, which should tell you all you need to know about both the good and not so good aspects of the show. Fantastic, intelligent, intelligent dialogue, nail-biting suspense, a few too many plot holes and seemingly nonsensical character decisions. Hey, at least there's no queer baiting. It's not for everyone, and on paper it shouldn't work. However, I'm a firm believer that good writing can't save bad actors, but sometimes great actors can save messy writing, and that's absolutely the case here, with David's performance as the absolute centerpiece of this fantastic cast. David plays Reverend Harry Watling, a vicar whose verger asks him to conceal a flash drive from his mother, which he later discovers contains CP. In a tragic misunderstanding, the flash drive is mistakenly linked to Harry's son, with Harry going to extreme and very ill-advised links to protect him, resulting in devastating consequences. If I could compare David's role in Inside Man to any other character, it would be early series Walter White. Harry's catastrophic errors in judgment can be a hard sell, but David manages to make each of them heartbreakingly believable, perfectly capturing the sheer desperation to do the right thing in impossible circumstances that ultimately leads Harry to lose both his sanity and everything he loves. The duality of compassion and darkness he displays is just so delicious, with his eagerness to damn himself for the sake of his family and honor coming across both painfully sympathetic and genuinely terrifying. My favorite scenes in the show or the ones he shares with his wife, Mary, played excellently by Lindsay Marshall. There's such intimacy and authenticity to their on-screen marriage, and it adds some much-needed humor, sweetness, and grounding in reality to this violently stressful story, though ultimately even it isn't safe from the consequences of Harry's actions. Sidebar, but David in general just seems to have such amazing chemistry with everyone he works with. He's been part of so many fantastic duos, from Miller and Hardy, to Crowley and Aziraphale, to all of his companions in Doctor Who, and come on, on. He's gotta be in the top 10 best on screen kissers. He's just so attentive and committed with every actor he plays opposite, and this role is no exception. Even also just looks so good in this show. Like, I definitely should not be saying that about this particular character, but man, that haircut with that blue button down had me feeling things. Take me to I think I just have a bit of a thing for stressed and depressed David. Like, eye bags have never looked sexier. If you're someone who gets really hung up on problematic plots, Inside Man probably isn't for you. But if you're a hardcore David fan such as myself, I can't recommend it enough. He's a tour de force in this show, and it's easily one of the most underrated performances of his career. So, what have we learned? I've made 
many attempts to somehow quantify David's essence into a few short and snappy words, which, as you can tell by the length of this video, is all but impossible to do. However, one in particular did ring quite true to me, and that is that David is a leading man with the soul of a character actor. There have been plenty of actors before David who've possessed similar auras and skill sets, but they're usually the villain, the comic relief, the quirky narrative foil. Think your Willem Dafoe's, your Brad Dorif's, your Gary Oldman's if you're lucky. These kinds of performers, beloved and acclaimed though they may be, are still for the most part rather of the margins. They don't usually get to be the romantic lead. So someone like David comes off as a bit of a shock to the system. He's sweet and handsome and charming and also really weird. There's a reason he's basically the quintessential nerd sex symbol. He's living proof that you can do both. David, of course, ever humble, is quick to dismiss himself as any sort of heartthrob. As he states in an interview with The Guardian, his bedpost really has very few notches. He described how when he played Romeo in his early Royal Shakespeare Company days, it was described as unconventional casting, which strikes me now as rather hilarious. Look how fresh-faced and adorable he is. Why shouldn't he get to play Romeo? But there has always been something rather uncanny about David that defies conventional ideas of what a leading man should be. And based on his own interviews, it seems that he agrees with me. I've never played the kind of straight down the line good guys, which is great. Yeah. Even playing Casanova, which you might imagine before you read the script, yes. is, a, is a much more sort of straightforward, ingenue, romantic lead. It wasn't really. He was a kind of slightly bonkers, kind of scampy type, you know, and I think that's much more my form. I'm not very good at the square-jawed heroes, really. It was the show where, where the hero wasn't a jock. Oh. As someone sitting in Paisley with a snotty nose and, <laughs> and uh, glasses with scotch tape round the, round the leg. Right. That was very important to me. I love oh, Bond I too, yeah. but I could, be, I could be the Doctor. Turned out I was. Behind that winning smile lies a certain chaos and unpredictability, a topsy-turviness in those lanky limbs, an alchemy of light and darkness all his own. There's always been a certain beauty of the grotesque in David's performances, a ready willingness to transform his fine features into something twisted, frightening, and decidedly unpretty, if that's what it takes to best bring a character to life, which speaks to a lot lack of ego many actors spend their entire careers trying to cultivate. David, at heart, has always been one of us. The geeks have inherited the world. I love it. I absolutely love it. We've won. A passionate fan of Doctor Who, Star Wars, and all manner of comics since long before they were cool, he both defends and sincerely participates in the gleeful, slightly unhinged obsession with which we nerds analyze our favorite stories. And no matter how many serious TV dramas he graces with his presence, he's always been a jobbing thespian at heart. With sci-fi and the stage as his first and truest loves, he's a real artist's artist, and it's difficult to think of another presumably straight, white, male actor who's more worthy of being hailed as a champion of the outsider. Which brings me to a rather big, potentially risky point I've been mulling over about David for a while, which may be a bit controversial, but I nonetheless think needs to be talked about. I've noticed a rather interesting pattern among some of my favorite creators and pieces of media. The art that moves me the most artistically and emotionally in any given medium is often dismissed by critics as overblown, bombastic, too theatrical. Happened with Queen, happened with Les Mis and Phantom of the Opera, happened with Titanic, and guess what? That's the first thing David Tennant haters will throw at him. One of the reasons I can relate to David as both a performer and a person is that we have both been accused numerous times in our lives of being too much, too dramatic, too energetic, too emotionally effusive, too unabashedly ourselves. And after reading a negative review describing David's Inside Man performance as increasingly fussy, I realized something. It's those darn gender roles again! One of my favorite things about David's acting is that when it's time for a character to be truly vulnerable, he never does it halfway. Shaking limbs, choked sobs, eyes wet with tears, heck, sometimes there's even snot! The man gives everything and withholds nothing, and it is stunning catharsis every single time. And it never comes off as just white guy yelling to win Oscars, either. It's fragile and pleading, like he's ripping out his raw, bleeding heart and handing it to you on a silver platter. 
And I feel like traditionally you see women give these kinds of performances a lot more often than you see men give them. I don't want to come across like I'm saying emotional expressiveness is an inherently feminine quality, but there's always been something about David's performances that stands in staunch defiance to societal gender norms. He may be known best for his on-screen intensity, but he just as often goes for softness. I can think of so many lines that could have been said angry or straight-faced that he instead imbues with such a gentle, compassionate passionate touch. David's masculinity is beautifully non-traditional. There's a certain grace to him, a delicacy. You're far more likely to hear me describe him as pretty or beautiful than as handsome. As at present future 7563 ever so eloquently put it in the comments section for the infamous Richard II kiss scene, mercy me, David is altogether too lovely to be a man. He's altogether too lovely to be a woman. He's altogether too lovely to be anything other than a seraph, descended onto us poor mortals by way of Paisley, Scotland, and masquerading as time lords and deposed kings. Think back to Casanova. None of the qualities that made David's version of him attractive to women are ones traditionally associated with masculinity. He was sweet, sensitive. He got girls because he listened to them. And what's more, it seems that David's subversive qualities are what earned him the role in the first place. Russell T. Davies put it best when he said of David at the National Television Awards, There's a lack of boring machismo with him. He skates over stuff, he dances over stuff, he's so nimble and light and clever. I've noticed in the past year that a surprising amount of David's characters either can be read as queer-coded or are portrayed that way explicitly. His Hamlet, for instance, his physical mannerisms, the way he wraps his mouth around certain words, it's all ever so slightly disaster by, with the obscene tenderness of his final scene with Horatio being the icing on the cake. Was that hair stroke really necessary? Richard II takes it a step further by having Richard lock lips with not one but two men, the latter filled with palpable yearning and romance, as well as infusing Richard with intentionally highlighted androgyny and borderline campness. Einstein and Eddington was considered groundbreaking for clearly portraying Sir Arthur Eddington's long speculated homosexuality, and his deep, desperate love and grief for another man is a crucial part of his character arc. Even Casanova, the infamous womanizer, is shown experiencing a sexual identity crisis when he falls in love with the castrato, Bellino, and ultimately accepts and embraces these feelings. Even if Bellino is eventually revealed to be female, he was fully prepared to love them regardless of gender. Don't even get me started on the new Doctor Who 60th anniversary special where the Doctor basically saves the day by being gender fluid. David doesn't shy away from a single one of these moments, if anything, coming across as rather eager to create them rendering each character's desires and longings every bit as full-blooded and believable as those of his heterosexual roles. David himself has been subject to quite a bit of speculation regarding his sexuality, and while I'm in no position to speak to the truth of the matter myself, all I know is the man really loves his wife and happens to be kind of great at kissing men. I can say with absolute certainty that the idea doesn't seem to offend him in the slightest. When asked if he was bothered by a couple of his friends earlier in his career thinking he was gay, he simply answered, why would it? Gay right. Throughout his career, David has been a steadfast advocate for the LGBT community, speaking on their behalf with sincere compassion and vicious idealism. We can't take our foot off the gas, that's the thing, and we can't expect that we will always travel in the right direction towards acceptance. We've got to, we've all got to be fighting that fight every day. This year, he attracted significant attention for wearing a t-shirt bearing the words, leave trans kids alone, you absolute freaks, along with a non-binary pin in support of his own child, Wilfred, who uses they, them pronouns. There is definitely something to be said for wearing a t-shirt isn't activism, but even that simple act comes with risks. The shirt literally got David accused of being a groomer. For David, it all comes back to fatherhood. You want your children to grow up in a world that is kind, and you want your children to be kind, and you want your children to be accepted for whoever they are. Whatever they want to be, they should be allowed to be whoever they want to be. And then, you know, everyone else just needs to butt out. For young people struggling to come to terms with their identity, hearing someone as beloved and iconic as David tell them it's okay to be who they are can be life-changing. As one Twitter user beautifully put it, David Tennant will have a legacy of keeping queer kids alive. Between both his roles and his real-life advocacy, he's done about as much for the visibility of queer people in media as a presumably straight man can do. And this is exemplified no better than through one very special character in particular. 
One you've probably noticed I've skipped, one who I believe not only cemented David as a queer icon, but who epitomizes just about everything I love about him as both an actor and a person. And with that, I think it's time we give a certain demon his flowers. Good Omens is a lot of things. It's a hilarious and brilliant satire of both toxic Christianity and corporate bureaucracy. It's a lighthearted, escapist, glorified rom-com about the literal apocalypse. It's a series I was all but destined to hyperfixate on due to it both starring my favorite actor and heavily featuring music by my favorite band. It will likely go down as one of the only true cult classics of an era where streaming services cancel everything without instant mainstream success left and right. And I have seen very, very few shows manage to do what Good Omens has done for the queer community. There are plenty of people more qualified than myself who've already made videos diving into how brilliantly Good Omens' Angel Demon love story portrays the intersection between queerness and religious trauma, so I won't dive too heavily into that here and instead focus on what the character of Crowley says about David himself. Let there be light. Crowley, in my opinion, is almost the quintessential David Tennant character because he represents the synthesis of so many of the unique qualities I have highlighted in David throughout this video. He's the perfect showcase of David's ability to fuse light and dark, humor and pathos. There's no greater example of that aforementioned beauty of the grotesque than those piercing, otherworldly yellow eyes, frightening at first in their sheer demonic intensity, yet gradually becoming all the more breathtakingly lovely as one grows more and more endeared to his character. Wow, Lauren, your zero fill is showing. I could go on for hours about how David's physical and vocal work as Crowley is quite possibly the best of his career. Unpredictable, uninhibited, and utterly inspired. That snake-like swagger and gravelly hardened hiss are just so instantly iconic, perfectly conveying both dangerous, untouchable coolness and an underlying core of burning torment. You told my only friend to shut his stupid mouth and die. And I did not care for it. You can see that same lost child aching for answers and yearning to be loved in Crowley that David brought so well in Hamlet. Again, we see that unmatched aptitude for finding humanity in the larger than life. It takes a truly special actor to turn a 6,000-year-old demon into a beacon of relatability for alt-queer teenagers everywhere. Crowley is a fiercely queer character. In his boundary-breaking love for Aziraphale, in his Mercury Bowie-esque style and mannerisms, and most importantly, in his defiant fashioning of his own self, an identity that he has fire-forged from the ground up after being cast out by a society that refused to accept him. A song I often associate with Crowley is the iconic gay anthem, I Am What I Am, from La Cage Fall, a song I've connected with ever since I heard it for the first time. I am what I am. I am my own special creation. So come take a look. Give me the hook or the ovation. <sighs> I have known and loved so many Crowleys. While most would describe me as more of an Aziraphale, Crowley and I share a persistent, gnawing sense of unbelonging, of being too soft for some people, too much of a wild card for others, and ultimately never really being able to fit in anywhere. All my life, I've taken such pride in my refusal to conform, as has Crowley, but it often comes at a truly painful cost. <laughs> Isabella, I've been alone for such a very long time. Loneliness is a core struggle shared by many of David's characters, and nowhere is it more poignant than with Crowley. Imagine all of the times in your life that you've ever felt like you don't belong, like you will never be truly understood, and then multiply that by 6,000 years. But it's that brazen defiance of categorization that makes Crowley one of David's truly career-defining performances. Haven't I made innumerable comments about David's utter refusal to be typecast, to conform to conventional notions of what a leading man can look or act like? 
Who better to play the demon who asks questions, the demon with an imagination, than one of the most curious and imaginative actors I know, who has always eschewed conventionality in favor of forging his own distinct, beautifully crafted personhood. I mentioned earlier in this video that the Tenth Doctor was my first gender envy, and things came full circle in a rather interesting way as Crowley ended up being hugely important to me coming to terms with the little spark of queerness in myself. Not long after I began using she, they pronouns, at first as more of an experiment than anything else, I began writing a song inspired by Crowley, which I can't share too much about for the time being, but hopefully can sometime in the future. Getting to inhabit his character for a couple of hours every night, along with the fact that I cosplayed him for Halloween this year, really helped it sink in that this felt right for me. That this isn't just a whim, but something that's been part of me all along. Like, yeah, at the end of the day, I'm still a girl, but there's a chaotic androgynous scamp inside me too that needs to be let out every once in a while. And I love both of those parts of myself. I wanted to bookend this video with, in my opinion, David's two most iconic roles, beginning with Ten and ending with Crowley. One irrevocably changed my life at 11, and the other means just as much to me at 19. Crowley is an icon of fluidity and freedom, reinventing himself over and over, refusing to be boxed in by anyone else's ideas of morality, gender, or side. Both within Good Omens and to those who watch the show, he challenges others to ask questions, to rage against the powers that be, and to refuse to allow any systems to dictate your own compass a patron saint of emancipation. <laughs>do I think of when I think of David Tennant? I think of energy, joy, passion, compassion, but also vulnerability, rage, and loneliness. I think of wit, charm, and a dash of chaos. I think of imagination, risk, authenticity, curiosity, and non-conformity. I think of epic speeches and ridiculous hair and that ever-present twinkle. But most of all, I think of love. Love for his family and his fans, love for Shakespeare and Scotland and sci-fi and the Proclaimers, and a deep, true, all-consuming love of his art. And sometimes, that love is hard. As an actor myself, I struggle daily with jealousy, comparing myself to others, looking at them and only seeing all the things I'm not. I let my perfectionism get in the way of my ability to play, to be my authentic self. And I look at someone like David, someone with such natural passion and talent and joy, someone who makes it look so easy, and wonder how I will ever manage to measure up. But something I've come to realize about David is that he has a lot of the same insecurities I do. David has been open about his struggles with imposter syndrome, anxiety, constantly being afraid he doesn't work hard enough. It seems that the man has never phoned in a single performance in his life. And it turns out that's because deep down, a part of him is always afraid it will be his last. That if he lets his foot off the gas, He'll have to stop doing what he loves because everyone will know that he's not good enough. So what I think I have to tell myself is that if he can overcome these insecurities enough to have a happy and fulfilling life pursuing acting, then maybe so can I. The upside of imposter syndrome I've discovered is that it means you never take a single opportunity for granted. It's a mindset that seems to have served David well throughout his career, and it's one I will continue to live by as I pursue mine. I noticed while perusing David's Wikipedia page that he's actually been far more snubbed in the awards arena than you would expect him to be given his accomplishments. He's frequently touted as the Hamlet of his generation, yet none of his Shakespeare roles were even nominated for Olivier's, and in spite of being a national television awards darling, he's somehow never been up for a main BAFTA. While he does have a couple of major trophies under his belt, they're not for the roles you'd expect. Des and The Escape Artist are undeniably excellent performances, but I've never heard anyone count them among their favorite David roles. Meanwhile, The Tenth Doctor, Kilgrave, and Crowley are all widely hailed as some of the most unforgettable characters in genre television, but sadly, these kinds of performances usually go unrecognized during awards season. Even the majority of his serious dramatic roles, like Alec Hardy, tend to go overlooked. I've often wondered why this is, and I think part of it is because David is a lot less 
of the establishment than many other actors from the UK. He isn't descended from aristocracy like Benedict Cumberbatch. He didn't go to a prestigious private school like Tom Hiddleston. No shade to either of them. I'm a huge fan of both of their work. He was just a nerdy minister's son from Paisley who worked really hard and loved Doctor Who. I definitely think it could also be due to how openly critical of the British government he is. Being outspoken about political issues as an actor is a lot less normalized in the UK than it is in the US, and I wouldn't be surprised if his strong beliefs may have hurt him a bit in terms of critical acclaim. He's always been, and will always be, a wild card. And while some may see that as a threat, to his fans, it's the thing we love most about him. The legacy he's left through just how much his characters mean to people is worth more than any trophy. I think David himself would take the amount of people who found an inspirational childhood hero in the 10th Doctor, a relatable representation of their queerness or religious trauma in Crowley, or fell in love with Shakespeare thanks to his Hamlet, Richard, or Benedict over a BAFTA any day. It's up to us to make it okay. It's time to be positively rebellious and rebelliously positive. As long as we stand up for what we believe in, don't give in to anger or violence. Look out for the little guy. Keep an eye on the big guys. Refuse to keep our mouths shut. And just generally try not to be dicks. <laughs> Every little thing is gonna be all right. For almost 30 years now, David Tennant has been encouraging the next generation of actors to be their most authentic, most vulnerable, most unhinged, kindest, freest, most liberated selves. Nowhere is the evidence of his impact more apparent than in his now direct successor, Shuti Gatwa, who cites both the Doctor and David himself as inspirations. I see so much of David's originality, charisma, and passion for performance in Shuti, and I'm so excited to see his interpretation of the character who's been so impactful to both his and David's lives. As someone who's been a fan of David's for nearly half my life, working on this deep dive and watching performances from across the entirety of his career has been heartwarming and emotional, to say the least. It's rather awe-inspiring to look at David at the beginning of his career, fresh out of drama school, youthful and hungry and eager, next to the person he is now, a husband, a father, and one of the most prolific actors of his generation, with every story he's ever been a part of written across his face. If by some miracle David is watching this video, or if Michael Sheen is, in which case he will probably make David watch it, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for making the world a better place with your humanity and your art. You may have become an actor because you wanted to play pretend, but you have given so many people something so real. And I can't think of a better legacy to leave. with me this long, I can't thank you enough. This video went from a silly little idea I had about two and a half months ago to something so much more. It ended up becoming one of the most fun, most exhaustive, and most personal projects of my entire life. I've spent more time and worked harder on this than maybe any other individual project ever, which is probably slightly concerning, but let's not worry about that because it's done. I have put the vast majority of my free time into this thing. I have spent so many hours, screwed up my sleep slash studying schedule to an insane degree, but it was so worth it. Is it too on the nose to say, I don't want to go? I cannot thank my family, friends, subscribers, and even a couple of my teachers enough for just listening to me go on and on endlessly about this silly Scottish man. Special thanks in particular to my glorious writing partner, Fiona, who was my soundboard for so much of this video as she is currently almost as obsessed with David as I am. She also provided inspiration for so many of the best parts of this video. The patron saint of emancipation line at the end of Crowley's section, that was all her. Man, I'm just... I'm so happy and proud. I really don't know how to end this. Um, well, I suppose if there's one last chance to say it, Rose time.